Good morning. It's so great. Yeah. Who was clapping? Patty. So, yeah, someone was clapping. Amen. Amen to those claps. <laughs> Good morning, Rainier Valley Church. We are so glad to see you today on this Lord's Day. And for those watching at home, we welcome you to today's service. Uh, church, let's go ahead and, and stand, if you're able, and let us hear from the Word of God so that we can uh, set our hearts and our minds to worship Him today. I will be reading from Psalm 81. Psalm 81. To the choir master, according to the Gittith of Asaph. Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Raise a song, sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon, on our feast day. For it is a statute for Israel, a rule of the God of Jacob. He made it a decree in Joseph when he went out over the land of Egypt. I hear a language I had not known. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. In distress, you called, and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Selah. Hear, O oh my people, while I admonish you. O oh Israel, if you would but listen to me, there shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe toward him, and their fate would last forever. But he would feed you with the finest of the wheat, and with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. This is the word of God, and you can respond with thanks be to God. This is the word of God, and let the church say, Amen. And let me pray for us as we begin. Heavenly Father, you have provided all of our needs each and every single morning, noon, and day, and nighttime. You are abundant in your promises. You are a God that is steadfast and is merciful, and you are a God of our salvation. And with that today, we express our gratitude and we express our thankfulness for what you have done for us, not because we deserve it, but because you are good. So with that, Lord, let us set our hearts to worship you this morning here at Rainier Valley Church. Let our songs of praise be glorifying to your name, and may you be with Pastor Kyle as he preaches the word faithfully today. Bless your church here at Rainier Valley and the churches around the world as we magnify and glorify your name. And all God's people will say, Amen. Amen, church. Let us sing together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praise 
praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. Perfect submission. Perfect delight. Visions of rapture. It was just last Sunday. Pastor Kyle was talking about stories, right? What is your story? Is your story about you? About just the things that you want to do? Or is your story about the risen Savior? At the very end, are you going to say that I have praised my Savior all the day long? If not, let that be your story today. Amen?
tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. We exalt his name and we bless his name today here at Rainier Valley Church. Let's sing this together. Let's give him a praise today. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. And as Pastor Kyle is coming up here, I hope it's okay if I gesture to you guys to sing because I just love hearing the church sing, right? I just want to remind everyone that, um, oh, Pastor Steve. Uh, <laughs> hey, Pastor Steve. I just want to remind everyone that this is not a performance, okay? For us to be up here, you are not an audience and we are not the performers we are the church we sing together amen 
Um, and s sorry, Pastor Steve, I just, I'm on like a Holy Spirit rant here. Lord, help me. I mean, it's just not a knock on, on other churches, but I want to develop Rainier Valley Church as a church that worships because I've been to way, way too many, I've been to way too many churches where I'm just sitting there and I have no idea what verse is coming up, what melody I'm singing, and it's, it's basically like a performance. And, I'm, and I can't sing that high, you know, what key are you in, and, and all that stuff. So we want to be a church that develops into a church of worship. And that means we sing together as a family. Amen? With that, Pastor Steve. Yeah. Y'all give it up for Ken. <laughs> all right. All righty. Well, good morning, church. My name is Steve. I'm one of the elders here at the church and I uh, want to welcome you to uh, Juniary. Those of you who are maybe recent transplants to Seattle, when it gets like cold like this, I just had a friend in town from Atlanta, also known as Hotlanta, and he's like, what in the world is this weather? And so, you know, we, we wear t-shirts one week and then rock a flannel the next, you know, so anyway, um, but glad you all are here. So good to be in church with you today. A few announcements for you. The first one is last week we had a members meeting and we proposed a new set of bylaws to the church. And just to remind the church that we're having some time, about a two week period for you to review those. Those bylaws, I believe, are posted up. Oh, there's, there's screenshots, there we go, I like it. So here's, here's a little glimpse of the, the members meeting right here. Um, but all of the, both the slides, video, as well as the summary of the bylaw changes and the actual 17 pages of the entire bylaws are posted on Slack. We also email them out on our church email address. If you still didn't get them, I mean, I can email them to you. I can, I think I can even text a PDF to you. We just want to make sure that you have a chance to review them. But the, the main just is, is we are transitioning to be more of a elder led church, which actually matches what is um, seen in the New Testament. And so we just want to be more biblical. And it also allows an opportunity for the members of the church, um, for, for you all to consider, like we would love to have more elders, we would love to have more deacons. And so it's something to, in this two week period, not only are we reviewing these bylaws, but we're also just praying that God would stir in the hearts of his people as he's done for thousands of years, that more people would raise their hand towards both eldership as well as becoming deacons and to, to empower even those of you who may be visiting to want to become members of this church. And so uh, be joining with us in prayer in that. And if you have any questions or concerns about the bylaws, feel free to see myself, Kyle, or any of the board members. We would love to answer any questions. Uh, second announcement is today is our second round of the Nehemiah 217 project. Give it up for that. So this project is based on uh, the series that we have been going through this summer, and we're going to continue in today and in the book of Nehemiah. God stirs up the heart of Nehemiah. He, he brings him to a point of lamenting the state of his city, Jerusalem, and to be a man of prayer towards it, and God uses him in the story of God to, to bring glory to him by seeking the welfare of this city. And so similarly, we wanna seek the welfare of Seattle. And so we'll be meeting right after the church service out in the lobby here. And we've been doing all types of things, whether it's removing graffiti, using plastic razor blades. I didn't know they had plastic ones, but plastic razor blades to scrape off stickers, been picking up trash, cigarette butts, and other nameless things. And so. I would encourage you all to come join us today. That'll be right after here. And I think it, today's gonna be a little bit shorter just with the weather, it's a little damp outside. And so we hope to be done within probably about an hour. So come join us, uh, we'll be, there's lots of ways that you can, you can serve. Lastly, there is a community group picnic at Gene Coulon Park this Thursday from 5.30 to seven. So Gene Coulon is in Renton, it's right over there, kind of close to where the Seahawks practice. It's a really nice park over there, but right next to the playgrounds, uh, a community group will be meeting from 5.30 to 7 to have dinner. Everyone's welcome, and it's actually meant to be something where it's, it's, it's very casual and something where if you have non-Christian friends, maybe who have been burned by the church and just, you know, or are just curious about the faith, this would be a great time to let them come and meet some other Christians in kind of a low-stakes environment, have a hot dog, and be outside. And hopefully it will be less January and more, more July-ish in terms of weather. So that'll be this Thursday from 5.30 to 7.00. Everyone's welcome to be there. In fact, I, I can imagine that probably the whole church could show up if y'all wanted to. Anyway, but it, it's just a good time of fellowship for us to get together. So those are our three main announcements. Uh, the one that I also wanted to add too, 
Um, Kyle, you'd be proud of me. I just want to uh, give some shout outs to the Bible reading plan. Uh, we're starting a new one, and our goal as a church is to actually read through the entire New Testament over the summer. And so this week, we've been doing uh, 1 John and Ephesians and Colossians, and I just want to share a verse that stood out to me uh, from the book of 1 John. This is from chapter 3, and it's just like, it's one of these small verses, but there is so much gospel goodness in it. And 1 John chapter 3 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God, and so we are. And so just to be reminded that because of what Jesus did on the cross, that we can be called the children of God. We have a heavenly father. We're like in a family. Like, he's our dad, you know? He's the one who, who, who's got our back. No matter what we go through, no matter what pain, what suffering, God is faithful and he is there with us and we are his child. And that brings us a, a comfort of comforts um, in the darkest days of the soul. And so I just wanted to remind that. Remind you all of that good word from our church or from our Bible. And so I'm going to pray, and Pastor Kyle's going to bring the word. God, I thank you for this time for us to gather as your family. And God, that you, what a privilege and honor it is to be called children of the Most High King. Lord, we will spend all of our lives and probably all of eternity trying to comprehend just how good of news that is. So God, I thank you that we are not here to be alone. God, that you have brought us into your family, and Lord, you have given us brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage, um, to convict, to listen, and to remind us of that good, good truth. I just thank you for the men and women and children that are in this room. God, for their stories, um, for the, the way that um, you have been working in their lives and will continue to do so. I do pray specifically for our church, God, that if there are men in this church that feel called and led to be elders, Lord, that you would work within their hearts, that they wouldn't do it under compulsion, but God, from a genuine desire to see good for your church and from a calling to follow after you. I pray for men and women to raise their hands as deacons in this church, to serve in a way that you have given them gifts, to take ownership of this church, Lord, to see something and say, I want to I wanna help in this area and I want to serve. And Lord, I just pray for members as well, that all of us as members would see that we, that there is no one member better than another, that this is one, one messy, squishy body that we are all members of. And we need toes, we need hands, we need ears, we need the, the thing by your nose that connects your nostrils, whatever that is. God, we, we need it all. Um, Lord, I pray that we would all belong to this body and see that we are needed uh, you call us to serve in your church, and I thank you for this time. I pray you be with Pastor Kyle as he preaches the word. And all of God's people said, amen. And the thing by your nose. Take it to step two. Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, good morning, everyone. If you have a Bible with you, I hope you do. Go ahead and open it to the book of Nehemiah. We're continuing our series. We're calling Nehemiah a season to rebuild. We've been in this series for 10 weeks if you're new with us or uh, maybe new uh, joining us online, I want to invite you. Um, uh, some of you have really started to enjoy this book, and some of you came in kind of later in the series. And so all those messages, Pastor Steve actually opened us up in the book of Nehemiah. All those messages are available online, on our website, video, audio, it's all there. And so I encourage you uh, to partake in that and get caught up if you're new with us. Uh, one thing before we dive into the text, I just want to highlight um, that's really unique to Rainier Valley Church. Um, and, and look at Mama Beth, uh, does such a sweet job. Do you see these flower arrangements every single week? I believe uh, this is also from Joy's Garden. I just want to highlight that. That's Especially if you're joining us online and maybe you see these incredible flowers each week. Um, yeah, go ahead and uh, let Beth know how thankful we are for that. So, Nehemiah, if you're new with us, this book um, is a story of rebuilding. And so, Nehemiah begins in the uh, Persian Empire, which was the greatest empire really in the history of the world at that time. Nehemiah is a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. He's the most powerful man on earth, and Nehemiah is in this position of influence. He gets to meet these world leaders. He gets to interact with, um, with this king, and what happens is that we, we find in um, chapter 1, uh, that uh, Nehemiah is a, a, a Jew. He is an Israelite. He's a, a member of the people of God. And um, uh, with that comes uh, certain uh, blessings and privileges and promises. 
And so the people of God were marked by uh, the mighty King David who established the, the kingdom of Israel. And God promised that through David, there would be one of his descendants that would inherit the throne forever and ever. And so David, uh, the people of Israel, and in particular, the city of Jerusalem are massive um, in the Israelite mind. And that is what's shaping Nehemiah's imagination, his longings, the promises of God that we see in the scriptures. And so what happens is Nehemiah is working his job, honoring his Lord, and he meets some brothers of his from Jerusalem. He says, how's it going there? And they say, the city is a mess. It's been destroyed, wiped out. It's in ruins. It's never been rebuilt. It's just, you know, we, we've compared it to Berlin after World War II, just destroyed, just a, a disaster. And so Nehemiah is so burdened. He cannot shake this feeling that not only has God um, uh, ordained and promised that Jerusalem would play this major role in salvation history, but that Nehemiah himself needs to be a part of it. And so he spends months praying and fasting and seeking God's will. Then he approaches the king and he says, will you send and finance me as I go back to rebuild the walls, rebuild the city? And the king agrees. He changes his foreign policy, gives passports and resources to Nehemiah and his crew. Nehemiah heads back from uh, the Persian Empire, from um, the, the, the temple, or rather the um, palace where he worked, and he goes back to the temple, to Jerusalem, to the city of God. There he finds that the city is in ruin, the people are scattered, the worship of God is an afterthought. And so Nehemiah surveys the wreckage of the city, he goes around on a donkey with a couple of folks at night, he sees that the city is so ruined he can't even get from one side to the other. And so he calls the people of God together, and this is where we got the new Nehemiah 2.17 project. This is where we got that from. He says, the city is in ruins. We are uh, in shame. Let us rise up and rebuild. And that's been the, the theme of this series. We call it Nehemiah, a season to rebuild. And so really from um, chapter 2 to chapter 7 is the story of God's people rebuilding the wall. You'll remember that they, uh, you know, uh, created sections of the wall, about 40 sections. They worked shoulder to shoulder. There were threats and opposition. People said, we're going to come and attack. And so they began to work with uh, uh, a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other, that they were both building and defending what God had for them. And so one through seven is rebuilding the wall. We see in 52 days, they finished the wall. But the whole point of the wall was um, that the city would be protected so the people of God could flourish. And so now we're in the second half of the book, uh, uh, chapters 8 through 13, and we've moved from rebuilding the wall to rebuilding the people. In chapter 8, Nehemiah has Ezra come out with the Torah, the scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and he opens it up and he begins to read, and God's people, revival comes into God's people, new spiritual life and passion and desire. And so, um, and then in chapter 9, there's, there's grieving over their sins. There's repentance. And now we're going to move into chapters. Uh, we're going to do three chapters today in summary. And don't worry, don't worry if you're feeling yourself like, oh my goodness, how are we going to do this? Most of it's lists, most of it's names. But each of these chapters has something significant happening. And this uh, ties in then with where we are in the story. So God has brought revival and repentance. Now the question is, what do you do with that momentum? Where do we go now? And, and in particular, what's interesting is we're going to look at these three chapters, and I have it under this uh, breakdown of rebuilding in obedience. So what does it look like to be obedient to God? And what's going to, and it's not a one-for-one -one parallel, but what is interesting that we'll learn from these chapters is really what God's people are doing in this season and section of Nehemiah is what we as God's people do every time we show up for church. So if you're watching us online or you're here this morning, you might think, what's the point of church? Why do we come to church? Here are three things that we're doing at church every single Sunday, reasons why we come, why we gather together. And so in Nehemiah, if you're a note taker, uh, chapter 10, we're going to look at renewing the covenant. Uh, chapter 11, we're going to look at repopulating the city. And chapter 12, we're going to look at rejoicing and worship. And the reason this parallels what we do here on Sunday is, Every Sunday we come, we renew the covenant, which is our relationship with God. 
uh, we, we repopulate the city, which is we, we encourage one another about the mission God has called us to, and then we rejoice in worship over who God is. So that's where we're going this morning. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be flipping around a bunch, so feel free to mark these things. I have uh, the slides as well, but um, let's start with renewing the covenant, renewing the covenant. So the people of God are recommitting their lives to follow after God. And what actually, <laughs> if you want to flip back to chapter 19, so in verse 38, this is, this is where this starts. Verse 38 of chapter 9 reads like this. It says, because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. So what's happening God's people have read the scriptures, they've been convicted of their sins, they want to follow after God, they've rebuilt the wall, they want to renew themselves as the people of God. And to do that, what they're doing is they are signing on the dotted line. They are saying, we are committing so that our great, 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 great grandkids can look at this document and remember that we signed saying, we're going to follow after God, we're going to honor him, we're going to be the unique people of God. And so God displays his glory through a identifiable people. There's a list of names. And if you read through it, a lot of them are hard to pronounce. A lot of them are strange names. Some of them are great baby names. I'll just say it. Um, but what we see in this, though, is that this list is incredibly significant, incredibly important. But more than just the list of people is what the, the, the list is getting at, what it means. Real repentance and revival requires change. What this looks like is it's a list, a big list of people. And it's not comprehensive, but it is um, explanatory. It shows God's people all signing up, saying that we will follow God's ways and not our ways. We will honor God, a new pattern in our family legacy. And it's not enough just to say no to sin. We're going to say yes to God. We're going to follow him. And so they are living for God, they're living in this covenant, they're living in community, and they want to live differently. And so if you have your Bible, go ahead now and flip to chapter 10, um, and we can pick it up at verse, uh, let's do 30. So there's three things in particular in this covenant, as they've read through the Old Testament, three areas they recognize they've fallen short, they haven't honored God. Three ways that they need to be a distinctive people. And when they sign this covenant, what they're saying is, this is what we're going to do differently. This is how we're going to honor God. And so the three ways that they are going to honor God are in their sexuality, their time, and their spirituality. And we're going to look at marriage, Sabbath, and the temple. So first, in uh, chapter 10, verse 30, they want to honor God with their sexuality. Look what it says in verse 30 of chapter 10. It says, we will not give our daughters to the peoples of this land or take their daughters for our sons. What they're saying here is as they're renewing the covenant and they want to be God's distinctive people, where that matters and what they're looking at is who they are connecting their kids with to marry. Apart from which God you will worship, who you marry is the most important decision you will ever make. Your husband or your wife will have the greatest possible impact on you that a person can have. And what these parents are saying is, hey, we want to honor God, so we're not going to have our daughters or our sons marry unbelievers. Or uh, some of your text, what it says in mine, I'm reading out of the ESV here, it says the peoples of the land. Some of your uh, translations might say, we'll not have them marry outsiders. Some of, the, uh, some of your translations might say foreigners or people of this land. What it's getting at here is not actually an ethnic distinction, but a religious distinction. And the reason that this is super important, places like uh, Ezra 6.1, it says the Passover, which was this special meal that God's people celebrated, Passover was eaten by the people of Israel and everyone who joined them and separated themselves from the un uncleanness of the peoples. So God's plan is a big, multi-ethnic family of every nation, tribe, and tongue. And so what makes us different is not our ethnic backgrounds, but who we worship. That's what this is getting at. And, and notice, too, that you see throughout the scriptures, whether it's Ruth, who was a Molevite that ended up marrying into the people of God, or uh, um, Rahab, who was in Jericho uh, uh, and was a, a Canaanite, um, it's not about an ethnic distinction, rather it's about a religious distinction. 
And in the end, you see, this, um, <laughs> you see this also in uh, Solomon, who ends up marrying hundreds and hundreds of women, and all of them don't love the one true God. And not only do they turn his heart, but they end up fracturing and ruining the nation. And so what these people say is they look over salvation history and they look over the history of Israel. As we're not going to have our sons and daughters marry people who are, are using our nomenclature Christians. And so um, here's what I would tell you. There's a, <laughs> when it comes to finding a spouse, right, very, very important decision. I know I've shared this story, but it's just so great I have to share it again. So um, my sister-in-law, after me and my wife got married, and uh, I'm singing the praises of marriage. I remember I was, I was sitting down uh, at dinner with her and talking about, you know, if she's, if she's lo- who she's looking for, right? What's kind of on her list of uh, someone that she would want to marry. And she had a very specific list. And some of the things on her list were, he's got to have fiery red hair. He's got to have this poetic heart. He's got to be so deep emotionally. He's got to write poetry and cry and be so in touch with his emotions. And he must, must, must be older than me. He has to be older than me. And I just remember chuckling and, and then going, so uh, Melissa, my, my sister-in-law, I said, Melissa, if you, if you meet a guy who's all of these qualities, but he's like a day older than you or uh, younger than you, would you not be interested? She's like, done, deal breaker. Wouldn't be interested at all. <laughs> okay, okay. So the, in the uh, strange and funny uh, irony of life, she ends up uh, marrying a gar- guy with, very dark hair, who is, is very emotionally even killed and does not write poetry. Um, but the one thing on her list, the most important thing that I hope is on your list, way at the top, is this guy honors and loves God. That is the most important thing, the absolute most important thing. And I just want to encourage you. I know there's uh, some of you out there. I'm doing what's called preemptive uh, counseling. I'm trying to head you off at the pass so I don't have to talk with you for years to come, right? Okay, so uh, I know there's some of you out there that are like, look, he's just, he's so handsome, he's so rich, he's so funny, right? We're just missionary dating. Uh, and what I would say is you're being silly, all right? Do not missionary date. The whole point of dating is marriage. And you cannot build a marriage or a family with two different foundations. And so um, if you would be willing, you don't have to if this is embarrassing, but I'd just be curious, show of hands, um, who was brought up in a, a family with maybe two different or various uh, religions and beliefs that were taught in the family? It can be very super confusing. It can be confusing as a kid to know uh, what's right, what's wrong. What, uh, if you don't marry someone who is a Christian, you're going to have all sorts of work on your hands. It's interesting, Naomi Riley, who's the author of Till Faith Do Us Part, says that 46% of marriages in the United States now are what she calls interfaith marriages. And the reason I bring all this up, you might be like, Kyle, why are you hitting on this so much? It's because evangelical Christians, which is our team, not just not a voting block, but by uh, definition, um, theologically and religiously, that's our team, evangelical Christians are the most likely to marry someone of a different faith. That means the people I'm, I'm talking with, you guys, are the most likely to say, it doesn't really matter. They say they're a Christian. They grew up in a Christian family. They'll, they'll come to church if I drag them. Interfaith marriages have the highest percentage of divorce at 61%. I, I, why does it marry if I marry a Christian or not? Why does it matter, rather? Why does it matter? Um, so you're probably familiar with this passage in 2 Corinthians 6.15. It says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership is righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? To yoke a set of oxen is to to put a weight on them so that they're together, unified, going in the right direction. Together. And then you have all the power of two oxen in front of your plow moving things forward. It's a very fitting uh, illustration of what a marriage should be. The power, the faith, the unity, moving forward, creating a family and an impact. And so what happens if you marry someone who's not a Christian is you're going to be pushing them along all the time. Or if if that illustration is is maybe too ancient, think about this for a second. When you drove here this morning or you took the bus, whatever vehicle you were in, chances are that the tires were aligned, right? You You have to get your car checked, and they want to check the alignment all the time. And it's interesting, if you go to leschwab.com and you say, what happens when the, uh, the tires are out of alignment and you don't do anything for a while, right? Here's what it says. 
When your car wheels aren't properly aligned, it can cause your tires to wear very quickly and very unevenly. You may even notice that your steering wheel may pull rapidly to one direction or the, no uh, or the other. Bad alignment can cause your steering wheel to shake and vibrate, which can be dangerous and could even cause an accident. If you are not aligned, if both of you do not love Jesus, you're going to grade and, I, I mean, think about this. I've seen this over and over again. You'll have different views on God, the Bible, creation, authority, purpose, identity, destiny, faithfulness, finances, sexuality, parenting, family. You'll be pulling in different directions. And you might think, gosh, Kyle, like, you know, this, okay, we get it, we get it. Or, you know, does it really matter that much? And here's what I would say. God's ways are not burdensome. The reason that he's emphatic and clear and repeats this over and over again is because he wants your joy. And so if that's the negative of all of the things that, uh, that will strain and will grade by not marrying a Christian, what I want to encourage you to, if you're young and single and, and you aspire to be married, what I want to encourage you to is the beauty and the unity of marrying a believer. Right, the, the sort of classic thing is imagine a triangle and you're both running towards God and you look over and someone's keeping pace with you. That's someone to think about for marriage. And the beauty of marrying a Christian is you can have a spiritual intimacy. You can pray together and hear them and see them bear their heart. You can read the scriptures. You can sing together. It is, it is a beautiful intimacy that you can have when you're following the Lord together. And I'll also say this. I know there are a few of you here who are married to someone who's not a Christian. First Peter outlines this. It says that we are to, to live with them and love them and that they will see our conduct and the way that we treat them. And that will be a witness to them of the difference that Jesus makes. And if, if you're one of those people, I want to encourage you. There is hope. We've seen situations like this where through love and faithfulness and prayer, the spouse becomes a believer. So do not give up hope. And if you need prayer, we'd love to, to pray for you and encourage you. And so they commit to only having their kids marry believers. They also commit to honoring God with their time. This is the Sabbath. And so in verse 31, it says this, And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day, and will forego the crops of the seventh year and the, uh, ext uh, the uh, extraction of debt. So what's interesting is that God's people are saying, okay, so we're, gonna, we're going to be different. We're going to honor God with our sexuality, with our marriage. We're also going to honor God with our work and our time. We're going to practice the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a sign that Israel was in relationship with God. No other nation practiced the Sabbath. The Sabbath was like a wedding ring. It was a gift that God had given that Israel got to uniquely bear and show the world. God's People are to be different than every other nation on earth. God's people were resting while others were working. I love the way uh, the theologian John Calvin said it. He says, God reigns in us when we rest in him. What's interesting is that the Sabbath, some people feel like, well, you know, it's kind of a little minor theme in the scriptures, but it's actually a mega theme that you can trace all the way through. And the interesting thing is if you read through the story of Israel, one of the reasons why they go into exile is because they do not keep the Sabbath. They're too busy working and earning, and they think that's where they're going to find their significance and their security, when it was always in God himself. And so I, I just want to encourage you this morning um, to practice the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a rhythm embedded into creation. Six days you work, one day you rest. The Sabbath was a distinctive given to Israel in the Mosaic law requirement. But as Christians, I also want to encourage you that we should see in the Sabbath a picture of what God has done in Jesus Christ. Hebrews 3 says that Jesus, in Jesus, in trusting in him and his death on the cross for us and our sins, that Jesus now has become our Sabbath rest. What does that mean? Well, traditional world religions teach that we must earn our salvation by fulfilling the checklist. And the checklist looks different depending on the religion. In Islam, they teach the five pillars of salvation. You bear witness to Allah, 
You pray to Allah five times a day. You fast during the month of Ramadan. You give alms to the poor. And if you can, you go on a pilgrimage to Mecca. In Buddhism, they believe in the Four Noble Truths, the right viewpoint, realizing the Four Noble Truths, um, that life is full of suffering, that suffering comes from our desires, that we can end our suffering by stopping our desires. Notice that all of these are a list, things you have to do, things you have to achieve, ways you have to power up and prove yourself. What makes the gospel altogether unique is that while the religions of the world are trying to build a ladder up to God, the gospel is God coming down to us. The gospel is upside down. The gospel moves us from being good enough and earning and proving to resting. The gospel is a gift. Grace is God coming down to rescue and restore us. In every other world religion, it's about earning and oppression and record keeping and law. But the gospel says it is finished, paid in full. You are accepted. Rest. Rest. So the Sabbath is a gift from God in creation. So we ought to keep it. We flourish in keeping it. And the Sabbath is also a picture of the deeper rest that we have in Jesus. In every way, though, it makes us unique as God's people. And then finally, they want to honor God with their spirituality. And this, in particular, is uh, fully addressed to the temple. So what was happening at this point is that the Persians, King Artaxerxes, who sent Nehemiah, they're still underwriting this whole renewal project. You'll remember that he gave them the finances and the resources to rebuild the wall. And so the king of Persia allowed Nehemiah to go back to Jerusalem, and he's doing all this on the king's bill. But now the people are ready to be the people of God. They don't need anyone else, certainly not a pagan king, to underwrite the finances. They're going to do it for themselves. The people are saying that they will support the work of the ministry. They will support the work that God does in and through the temple. And the temple was the, the epicenter of God's salvation work in that time. It's where heaven and earth met. It's where sacrifices were offered. It's where people could meet God and walk with God and be forgiven of their sins. And nowadays, even though we come together in the church, the temple, the connection place between heaven and earth, is Jesus himself. And so it's him we proclaim and him we lift up. We want to make much of Jesus. We're his people. And it's in Jesus and when we come to him that we experience what these Old Testament saints experienced in the temple. And so look at them willing to open up their hearts and their wallets to give and to support the work of God. Verse 32, it says, for the, uh, here's all the different ways. Uh, they gave, uh, verse 32, for the service of the house of God. Verse 33, for all the work of the house of God. Verse 34, to uh, our God's house. Verse 35, to the house of God, and, and so on and so forth. You get the idea. And they're giving their, their finances. They're giving things as simple as wood because there would be sacrifices that were offered. It also is interesting. It says they gave their children. Unless you think there's some kind of weird thing going on here, what it's talking about is that every time they have a baby, Scripture says that children are a blessing from the Lord. And so what they do is they honor that this child is ultimately God's. They take the child to the temple. And similar to what we do here at the church, we call child dedications. They present the child to the Lord, and the priest will pray over the child, and they recognize from the beginning as they parent and they pour themselves out for this baby, that the baby is ultimately God's. And so they are refiguring, renewing their whole life around God, that he would be the center. And it's interesting because these three things that they pick, they all show what we believe, the truth of the gospel. Marriage is a picture of Christ in the church. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. That means sacrifice. That means care. And, uh, and wives are to respect their husbands, to honor their husbands as the church honors Christ in everything. So marriage, the, the simple, profound, life-altering dynamic of a marriage shows the truth of which God we worship and follow. And then how we treat our schedule and our time shows the truth of which God we worship and follow. And what we do with our spirituality and the impulse towards worship shows the truth of which God we worship and follow. It all, every part of your life is an opportunity to make much of God, to lift up Jesus because he is worthy. And so they renew the covenant. And we'll do that this morning. 
Um, every week, and we're a little different than most churches. Some churches celebrate the Lord's Supper once a month or once a quarter. Um, but we, out of conviction and what we believe is clear biblical teaching, where it says, as often as you come together, do this in remembrance of me. So at the end of every service, we do a, a covenant renewal ceremony. Like, uh, for instance, me and my wife are coming up on um, another big anniversary. And so we're, we're looking at doing a trip. And, and the point of an anniversary celebration is to remember the covenant that we make. So every Sunday when we gather together, we take one of those little cups and we remember the covenant that we have with God, that he sent Jesus to live the life we couldn't live, to die the death that we deserve. When we take that little cracker and we break it, we remember his body broken for us, the weight and cost of our sin. And then we open up the little cup with the juice in it. Remember his blood was spilled out because of his love, his forgiveness, we can be reconciled to God. And we remember it every single week in a simple little covenant renewal ceremony, just like the people here. Well, they renew the covenant, and now they've got to remember the mission. And the mission <laughs> at this point is to repopulate the city. So Nehemiah 11 is basically another long list, but we'll start with the first two verses to understand the list. Um, here's the truth. At this point, nobody wants to live in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's a dump. A bunch of years ago, me and my wife uh, went to visit her family, and um, <clears throat> they live in Michigan um, and outside, kind of in the, in the suburbs. And so I'd never been to Detroit, and I want to go to Detroit. And if you're from Detroit or you have family there, I apologize in advance. But anyways, so we jump in the car, and we drive into Detroit, and we're just driving around, and that place, man, has seen better days. I'll just say it like that. It's seen better days, okay? Um, you know, property values, though. Wow. Okay. But um, anyways, so Jerusalem is a little bit like Detroit, right? The city had a great history, but it has seen better days. And where you really want to live is in Persia, where Nehemiah is from, right? There's, there's wealth, there's culture, it's established, and it is so safe. It's the greatest empire in the world. And so as people came back, they had ancestral land around Jerusalem where their forefathers would work the land and had farms and stuff. And so if you were willing to leave Persia, then at the very least, you wanted your land. You wanted a couple of horses or a cow or some chickens, right? You wanted some room to stretch out. You didn't want to be in the city. Jerusalem had high crime, high prices, terrible real estate options. It was not safe and there was no land. Not a place that people would want to be. But what's interesting is that um, there was more driving these people than just their comfort in the moment. Jerusalem was important. Jerusalem, biblically, is the geographical center of the world. When you read the Old Testament, it says north, south, east, west. It's talking from Jerusalem. It's the epicenter. It's the spiritual salvation center of the world. This was the, the, going to be the, the city of the King David and his son who, who would be on the throne and would rule the world. This is the prophetic epicenter of the entire world. The Messiah was to come to Jerusalem. This is where the temple was. So there's more motivating these people than mere convenience and comfort. And I want to ask you, what motivates you? So verse 1 of chapter 11, now the leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem. So the leaders are there. It's what leadership is, going first, showing it by example. And the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine out of ten remained in the other towns. Nobody wanted to do this so much that it's like, okay, here's the deal. We're, doing, we're, in, we're conscripting people. We're doing a draft, all right? One out of every ten of you is going to go and live in the city. I don't want to. I don't want to. You're going to, all right? And what I, wanted, I want you to see here is so casting lots was kind of an ancient, um, an ancient way of basically rolling the dice, right? And um, we have now through, uh, in salvation history, we have the Holy Spirit. We have the wisdom of Scripture. We have the, the family of God in the church that can help us to make decisions, right? But one thing I do want to encourage you to see in their, their uh, casting of lots to choose who's going to go live is their utter and total understanding of God's complete sovereignty. He is so in charge of the world that even the, the, the rolling of the dice, he knows what's going to come up. And so I want us to have that kind of understanding of who God is. 
And so it said this, um, verse 2, And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered to live in Jerusalem. There were some, it's unclear whether these were the people who just got picked, but it seems with the, the thing of willing, there were a few who said, forget the dice. I'm in. Are you sure? It's really expensive. I'm there. Are you sure? It's really dangerous. I'm willing to be there and raise a family. Are you sure? Everybody's leaving. I'm there because that's where God's called us to be. And I'll just tell you the easy and obvious parallel right now. As I see a f- fleet of U-Hauls headed off in- into other places, greener pastures, if you are here, God has called you for such a time as this. It is not easy. It is not cheap. And things don't go the way that we would want them to here in the way that the city is run. But if this is where God has called us, then this is where we will be. So what's interesting is that it says um, in a few more verses uh, the, the respect that these folks who were willing to live there were given. Verse 6, it says they were valiant men. Verse 8, they were men of valor. Verse 14, mighty men of valor. Three times the church family, if you will, comes along around these people and says, good job. We're proud of you. You're brave and courageous. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for staying faithful. Thank you for staying in the city. Thank you for doing the hard thing when it would have been easier to just check out and leave. And so one of the obvious um, applications is, are we a community that encourages one another, that thanks one another? Are we a community, especially in this time of transition and change where we're looking um, and going a new leadership direction, Are we a community that is thoughtful and prayerful about where God might be calling us? I believe with certainty that God will call some of you to lead, some of you to lead community groups, some of you to start ministries, some of you to be missionaries and go to other parts of the world. When we are being fruitful, it says that the body builds itself up in love and God gives all different sorts of assignments. The question is, what's your assignment? And are you receiving it with a joyful heart? Or are you like, oh, not that one, Lord. I don't want the dice to roll on me. I'm, I, no thanks. Here's the truth. Most of us operate with a sense that the Christian life should be safe and comfortable. And that is nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible. In fact, I would ask you this. When is the last time you took a risk for the glory of God and the good of others? Not a stupid, silly risk, but a God-honoring risk. You risk something. Maybe the way someone perceived you, maybe your reputation at work, maybe a little bit of your finances. When's the last time you took a risk? You got up early. You risked being tired to open your Bible and to pray. Maybe you, you risked giving to the church or worthy Christian ministries. Maybe you risked inviting someone that you met at church out to lunch to get to know them. Maybe you risk telling a friend or a coworker or a family member about Jesus. When is the last time that you risked? When is the last time that you gave your time and your treasure and your talents to Jesus because they're ultimately his anyway? And you might think, but I'm afraid to fail, and what if I mess up, and what if I get burned, and what will people think of me? And here's what I would tell you, that God has given you not a spirit of fear, but of power. Joab, one of David's generals, going into battle against a massive army, there almost is no hope of victory. He goes to battle to defend God's people, and he says this in 2 Samuel 10, 12. Be strong, and let us fight bravely for our people in the cities of our God, and may the Lord do what seems good to him. Esther violates the laws of the kingdom to go before the king to plead for the lives of God's people. And in 4.16, she says this famous line, I will go to the king, even if it's against the law, but I thought Christians were supposed to keep the law all the time. And if I perish, I perish. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being condemned to death for not worshiping what the whole culture bowed down to worship. And if you're a loving person, if you're tolerant and into diversity, bend the knee. Well, you can bend the knee and just honor Jesus in your heart. Why does it matter? And they're brought before the king, and it says, if we are thrown into the blazing fire, the God who we serve is able to save us from it. 
and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, that story could have ended very differently. Even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Do something, brothers or sisters. Make a godly risk. Come what may, I'm going to honor the Lord. C.T. Studd said it this way, Only one life, and twill soon be passed, and only what is done for Christ will last. And when I am dying, oh, how happy I will be if the lamp of my life has burned brightly for thee. So we are to renew the covenant, we are to remember the mission, and we are to rejoice in worship. The final section, chapter 12, is basically this, <laughs> this massive, uh, big blowout dedication ceremony. Verses 27 through 42, this is a sanctified Coachella or South by Southwest big old worship festival, right? So verse 27 of chapter 12, it says this, that at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places, right? Go get the guys and the gals who can sing, who know how to play an instrument, who can hold a tune, right? And we need to celebrate. Bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with, and you can underline this or bold this, with gladness, with thanksgiving, with singing, with cymbals and harps, and it just goes on and on and on. They're dedicating the city and the wall in this new season to God. They're setting up this place as a place marked differently than any other, one marked by worship and joy in God. And I would encourage us to think when we come to church, there should be a palpable joy amongst God's people. Not a fake, artificial, surfacy, happy, clappy sort of joy, but a deep, abiding joy. That even though a dear friend of mine just tragically went to be with the Lord, I know that he is with God. And I have a joy that transcends even death. We have much to be joyful for. We're adopted into God's family. All of our sins are forgiven. We are going to heaven. Grace should fuel singing. And liberated people should be a singing people. It's interesting. I, I, you know, I, I did a, a seminary class where I had to go around to various different um, other religions, uh, worship centers, you know, to, uh, and so on and so forth. And what, what, what I found really fascinating is that Many, if not most, other world religions do not sing. Did you know that? There's some chanting. Maybe a, a leader will sing something to the people. But most world religions don't sing. It is the liberated people of God who sing. We sing to God. We sing to one another. We sing when we rejoice. We sing when we mourn. We sing at weddings. We sing at funerals. You can't read the Bible and miss the importance of singing. Exodus 15, God parts the waters. The people go through. They're free. What's the first thing they do? Bust out the tambourines and let's get that first worship song in the Bible going. Exodus 15, they're singing. Throughout the entire salvation history, singing. You turn to the book of Revelation. Guess what you find there? Singing. Singing, singing, singing. 14 hymns that are sung in heaven. 14 hymns. And I love this. If you skip all the way to the end of chapter 14, final verse, it says this, verse 43. It says, they offer great sacrifices, huge party, rejoicing. God did all this. We rebuilt the wall. We weren't attacked. 52 days. The, the king of an evil pagan empire financed this. And we're going to now celebrate. So with great uh, sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice. And then look at this, seems kind of redundant, but you get the point. God made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced. The whole family's on, in on it. And then I love this. The joy of Jerusalem was heard from far away. You ever, you ever walk by, like, what is it now? Uh, T-Mobile Park or, you know, like, Safeco Field or whatever. They keep changing the rims. And, like, you know, everyone's cheering and you can hear it from far away. Imagine if God's people were like that. Imagine if somebody's walking over there by Hope Place and they're like, what is that? What is that? Well, that's God's people rejoicing in God's grace. Why, why is singing so significant? Well, first, God commands us to sing. So listen, Mr. Tough Guy, I'm so cool, I don't need to sing about anything. Oh, manly, oh. Psalm 47, 
the most manly man that ever manned, right? He cut off Goliath's head. He pens Psalm 47, and it says, sing praises to God. Sing praises. You are commanded to sing. God doesn't want us to just say good things or true things about him. He wants us to sing good and true things about him. And singing convicts us. I remember when I was uh, just this angry atheist kid in college, and I went to a youth group. I wanted nothing to do with God. I got dragged there by some friends. I was angry, hurt, bitter. It's a, a long story, right? And I remember sitting there, and I heard these kids, and they started singing. And they sang, Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. More, uh, you're more beautiful than diamonds, and nothing I desire compares with you. And I look around, and I see kids like with their eyes closed and tears coming down their face. And I make so much fun of them, and I say that they're silly and they're stupid, and I label all of them as ignorant and naive. But as I walked out that night, and I'm sitting by myself, I started to think for the first time, is my conscience seared? Is there something more important in this life? Have I rejected God? Singing is power. Singing is spiritual warfare. Singing reminds us of the truth. Singing brings us comfort in the midst of great difficulties. Uh, the scripture says that God inhabits the praises of his people. When we are together, unified, Jesus promises that he will be there in a unique way. And when we sing together in one voice, there is power. So I want to encourage you that you sing because the person next to you might be dying of cancer. And you sing because the person behind you is struggling with addictions that they feel like they'll never be free of. And you sing because the person two aisles over hasn't been to church since they were a kid. And you sing because the person in front of you has to get up and preach and is freaking out about it. <laughs> Gordon Fee said this, you show me a church's songs and I'll show you their theology. When we sing, we adorn what we believe about God. We celebrate who God is and what he has done through his songs. You probably won't remember pretty much anything of what I said, but you will remember what we sang. And singing helps us to express our emotions. I love the way Charles Spurgeon said it. He said, music can provoke our deepest emotions and bring us to tears and make us laugh. I would sooner risk the dangers of a tornado of religious excitement than to see that the air grows stagnant with a deadly formality. Let us sing. John Piper says it this way, the reason we sing is because there are depths and heights and intensities and kinds of emotion that will not be satisfactorily expressed by mere words or even poetic readings. These are realities that demand us to break forth into song. Music and singing are necessary to the Christian faith. And worship for the simple reason that the reality of God and Christ and creation and salvation and heaven and hell, it's all so great that when they are known and truly, deeply felt, they demand more than discussion. They demand more than cold anal analyzing. They demand poetry. They demand song. They demand music. They demand that we sing. Singing is the Christian way of saying God is so great that thinking will not even suffice. There must be deep feeling. Talking will not suffice. There must be loud singing. And I love the way the, uh, in Religious Affections, the theologian Jonathan Edwards says it. He says, the duty of singing praises to God seems to be appointed wholly to excite and express our religious affections. No other reason can be assigned. Why should we express ourselves to God in verse uh, instead of uh, music, but only that in such our nature and frame that these things have a tendency to move our affections? For this to have the weight that it does for Edwards, we need to remember that um, true religion consists in affections. It's not enough to just think right thoughts about God. We want to feel who God is and then express it. We want to be able to sing. And so this morning, 
we'll conclude by renewing our covenant. I want us to take a moment before we come to the Lord's Supper. And the whole point of a, a covenant renewal is that we remember who we are in front of God. And so I want us to take a moment and just consider, as you come to the cup, remembering Jesus' body broken and his blood spilled, who are you? Are there areas you fall short? Are there ways you need to honor God? Are there ways we need to become truthful? It's not enough just to, to, to receive new thoughts. We want to interact with the living God. So let's take a moment. You can um, grab communion. If you're watching us online, I'd invite you to prepare the elements. And in just a moment after some prayer, uh, we'll go ahead and partake together, renewing our covenant with Jesus. partake in the Lord's Supper together. I want to invite you to take your communion, very carefully tear off the plastic lid and remove the wafer. Scripture says this, for I received from the Lord what I have also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was to be betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us proclaim his death in our place for our sins. So brothers and sisters, we've come together. We've renewed our covenant. We remember our mission. And now let us rejoice in worship.
Well, church, you heard the message from Pastor Kyle today. Uh, as we went through Nehemiah chapters 10 through 12. And let us respond the way the Lord has called us to respond. And that is with singing. Amen? And for, for, um, for this, um, I thought of, of, a, of a hymn that I haven't sung ever since I was a kid. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with this hymn, but it has really catchy rhythm and catchy melody. So you'll be able to pick it up uh, very easily. But with that, uh, let's go ahead and stand if you're able. And this hymn talks about God's promises that he made with his people. And let this hymn be a reminder that the Lord will never leave us nor forsake us, that he will be with us uh, regardless of what happens in the world. And let's express our thankfulness and our gratitude to him with our voices of praise. So church, let's go ahead and sing this together. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Let me pray for us as we conclude our time together. Father God, today we are standing on your promises. You have made a covenant with your people, and Lord, give us the strength to fulfill that covenant along with you. You have been so good to this church, O oh Lord. 
we have been together as a family for a few years now, and we are looking forward to what you have in store for the years ahead. So, Father God, let us remain steadfast in all things because we know that your promises will never fail. And just like what the song says, your perfect cleansing blood is in us, standing in the liberty where Christ makes us free. And with that, Lord, let us not forget your covenant promises to your church body. As we leave this place today, may you be with us as we go forth to wherever you have sent us, in our families, in our homes, in our workplaces. Be with us, O oh Lord. And Holy Spirit, continue to guide us in the word, in season and out of season. And let us remain steadfast as we bear the sword of the Spirit. So thank you so much, Father God. And bless the Nehemiah 217 project today. May we serve our community well. May we show the love of Christ to our neighbors here in this community by showing that we care for one another and for our neighbors and our loved ones. So with that, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and may he give you peace. And all God's people will say, Amen.